To understand ecology is to understand that things rely on each other. And this theme in ecology is this interconnectedness, interdependence. So things don't live in isolation. No one can really survive in isolation. We depend on other organisms, living and non-living things, tremendously to get through. Um, think of five things that in your head right now that you feel that you depend on. It might even be people in your life, but even if you said other species, other things such as a plant, how do you depend on that? That's a theme in ecology to understand how we are all connected together because of maybe molecules that circle between us, energy that flows between us. All these things rely on each other. The next two terms, biotic factors and abiotic factors, I can guarantee will be on a keystone exam question. Every year, it is there. You will recognize it. Please commit it to an understanding level. Biotic factors are, with the prefix bio, look at that. They are living components that affect an organism. So I just ask you to think of things that you're connected with. Any of those things on the, the living side. Think of something that is around you, that was alive at one point, and how it has helped you. That is a biotic factor. Think of the plant that is outside your house that is providing the oxygen for you to breathe. Biotic factor. And there could be a plethora of them. I can't go through every single one, but that's a good example. Abiotic factors, place an A in front of that and it says without. So this is a non-living component that affects an organism. Think of things that don't rely, they're not living, they don't have the characteristics of life. Sorry, in terms of abiotic factors that are non-living, think of things like humidity, um, think of rain, think of things that affect you, um, temperature, uh, you know, just giving you a, a plethora, like weather, a lot of those things would be classified. Um, if you're in water, think of the pH. All these things are abiotic factors because they don't have a living component to them, but they do have an effect on maybe your survival or how you adapt. Acclimation is how an organism adjusts within an environment. So you've probably used the term acclimation in your history class or social studies where an, an individual must acclimate to the culture potentially that's around them if they go to a foreign um, city. So acclimation is an adjustment to an organism's abiotic factors. So think of how do you acclimate to high humidity, to high temperatures, to low temperatures. That's an acclimation. So that's what you're doing when you put on a jacket, when you, um, you know, those types of things. I don't think you have to go further. But the next two terms relate to each other. And organisms that are classified as conformers, these are organisms that do not regulate their body temperature. Really, the environment controls them. And you might think of that more as a cold-blooded organism where you've learned that term, you know, reptiles, where they somewhat mimic the temperature that surrounds them. That's a conformer. They really don't have as much of the homeostatic or homeostasis controlling mechanisms that regulators have. And a regulator is an organism that requires the use of energy to control their internal conditions. So organisms that are warm-blooded would be regulators or anything that would need or use energy to control some type or aspect of their, um, you know, internal conditions. So those are two words. They're related to each other. And there's an example for each. So if organisms say that they are conformers and the temperature drops, they can't acclimate too much because, again, that, that temperature might be too low. So there are opportunities to escape. You must escape anything that's unsuitable. If they could not acclimate to reach their needs, escape. Two options. Dormancy. Dormancy is a state of extended reduced activity. So you can think of hibernation as dormancy. The second would be migration. So organisms, if they don't want to fall asleep, they don't reduce their activity, they got to get out of there. And that's the whole idea of a migration. So you can think of organisms that go and choose dormancy as an option. You can think of organisms that choose migration as an option. 
moving to that more favorable location that has the factors that they need or really, you know, hope for. The next term, I've heard it many different ways. You can say niche, you can say niche. You're always going to see it written down, so it really doesn't matter how you pronounce it. But what we have here, a fundamental versus realized, I'll say niche. A niche itself, this general term, is the role a species plays in its environment. So think of your role, the role you have as a student, the role you have on your sports team, the role you have in the orchestra. That is your niche. That is what you bring to the table. So it can be applied in many different scenarios. Even in your everyday language, you can say, this is my niche. Fundamental niche versus realized niche. A fundamental niche is the range of conditions or roles that a species can potentially have. So maybe some of you have a much broader fundamental niche. Maybe you haven't shown me that you have the ability, you know, to, to really dive down and ask questions and, and be very, um, you know, interactive. Some of you don't tend to take that, that role in the classroom. Others of you definitely take that role. Realize niche is what you actually do. So it's the range of the resources that you use. It's the, the role you actually take in the environment. That's your realized niche. And under that category, we have, again, two, this whole chapter really is about vocabulary. That's, it's me exposing you to these words that might be used in questions. Generalists are organisms that have broad niches. And a broad niche would be something that can withstand or have a lot of roles, can use a lot of resources, so think of organisms that have that ability. Humans, a lot of insects, cockroaches, you know, raccoons, think things that can really work. Whereas a specialist, a specialist is an organism with a narrow niche. They have very specific tolerance. Um, you know, in an everyday language, think of there are doctors that are generalists, your family doctor, but then there are specialists. If you have a specific thing that you have to work for that they know a specific subset of, of medicine, think of those examples as ways to remember those types of terms that are now kind of applied in an ecological sense. We switch gears to understanding population, and the first word here is population density, and a lot of students get this confused, where population density is really how crowded an area is. It's not how many people are there. It's not a population size. It's how crowded an area is. So you're looking at, it's a number that represents a number of organisms, or you know, in this case, it could be humans, the number of humans within a specific area. So that area could be a square mile. So how many people are there? That's the density of it. So you kind of need a number per unit area. So think of the, the world and think of countries that you, th if they categorized their country in population density, which country do you think might have the largest population density? I ask this in class. A lot of students go for your higher populated areas. China, India, those are not your highest population dense areas though. Bangladesh. Um, so some of your smaller countries that they don't have a large size population, but they're packed wall to wall with people, you know, I think you even talk about them in your, your world history class. Um, these countries, I've had former students that say we've talked about this in class. So they kind of knew their, those answers, but think of a, think of states in the United States. What, con what, what states might have the, the highest population density? All right. We have Pennsylvania has a lot. But if we spread them out across the area of the state, it probably wouldn't be that dense. Whereas you might think, think of a smaller, smaller states that are pretty popular. You know, is Rhode Island? It's a small state. 
I'm not really sure what the actual population density is. You can look that information up, but that's where you're getting to. So I just want to make sure that there's a clear line between population size, population density. How organisms spread themselves out are in patterns. So there's three different patterns. I don't have them labeled, so you'll have to label them, but they are drawn. So this is what's known as a clumped dispersion. So very easily named clumped. So these dots represent different organisms in a population. So what types of populations clump? Think of fish. Fish are in schools. They are in a population that is very clumped. Um, you can think humans do this as well. We do not spread ourselves out evenly. We have a lot of people on the coast, not so much centralized. We have a lot of people in big cities. Think of any organism that works as a group. I'm sure you have more, so you can do that. That's clumped. Um, even, that's the second one. So the dots are pretty evenly spaced from each other. Organisms that run territories con commonly space themselves out evenly. So male lions, well, they don't work with each other. They kind of have a, an area that they cover. So they can only cover so much area. So they can't really spread themselves out too thin. So another male lion might have another area. So that's how they kind of evenly disperse themselves. Plant life could be evenly dispersed. So it can be artificially dispersed, such as a cornfield. That's even dispersion of a population. And the final one is random. So random is not really about what the pattern is. So you can see here there are some areas where you have um, clumped. You have some areas where they are spread out. Random is more about how it happens. So random dispersion might be how trees in a forest, how they are planted, maybe an organism um, had a seed, consumed a seed, dropped it later on, it fell. Flowers, dandelions, the wind disperses them. So you really, random doesn't, you don't know how it's going to pattern. It's just where, you know, the wind drops the seed. So a lot of plants would, would kind of do that. I don't think humans randomly do it. But that's the best example are some of the, the wildflowers you can think of as random dispersion. So continuing with population and say, what makes populations dynamic? Dynamic means that they're constantly changing in size and composition. So there are three major factors that can affect the population dynamics. Birth rate. So birth rate is generally an equation, and, and it's a number. You can kind of say it's, they often do it, how many people are born in a specific period of time. So maybe they do the birth rate per year. You know, could you bring it down to per day? Yeah, you get to decide what the range of period is, but the birth rate is a specific number of births that happened over a period of time that you decide. And that goes right hand in hand with death, where the death rate is the number of deaths that happened over a certain period of time. So if the birth rate exceeds the death rate, then your population is going to increase. If the death rate is higher than the birth rate, then your population will decrease. Another factor that plays into this is life expectancy. So life expectancy, what is going to be the average length of time that that person is on this planet? And, you know, every year that kind of changes. You know, you might think how the expectancy of life is probably in the 70s at this point. Little fact that the generation that you are currently in is, I think, one of the first ones where they're predicted that the life expectancy of this generation is actually going to be smaller than the expectancy of their parents. So what that means is the average person of the previous generation might um, have a lifespan of about 75 years, you know, just making this number up. But the next generation might have it at 72 years, whereas each year up till this last one, they've been going up and up and up. So that's kind of an interesting fact that I, I've seen in recent um, textbooks. So what I'll do is I'll stop there for the second video and we'll continue into uh, exploring more about populations in the next video.